and welcome back to my channel. My name is Rachel, that is the R in the RK Stumbling Bear, and I am a reader and a writer. I just found out that my original intro has disappeared, so I am re-recording this. What you're gonna see is a video of me reading the Nebula short stories, and then I will rank them according to my taste. I am not a member of SIFWA, and that is the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Association. Those are, you have to be a member, a published author member to vote in this, but I always find these interesting because at least a few of these stories will be nominated for the Hugos I normally find. You will see me in a little bit. Check in to talk more about the short story that I have most recently read, and that is Delayed Destiny by Ogehenejewo Donald Ekpeki. I'm totally, I know I keep butchering this, and an interesting note before I jump into the actual story, there are two characters that have the beginning of his first name is also the beginning of their names, and I'm just like, okay, so what you're saying is this is a normal naming convention in Nigeria. And I feel awful that I am having such a hard time pronouncing it. I think Ekpeki does amazing with creating sci-fi situations in our world. And so this is definitely another near future sci-fi where in Nigeria they have created the process of soul mapping where you look at someone's inner soul and they can see your destiny. And so banks now have a machine where if you're needing a loan, you can have your destiny pulled out and use that as collateral, or you can do that, have your child's destiny pulled out and used as collateral. So the story actually starts off with Mr. Makoro, who is working on his own soul mapping research. So this is a well-known thing here in Nigeria during this time. And because of political changes in their country, he's just not able to get the funding that he needs to complete his research. And he's trying to figure out how he can give his family a better life. His wife has just become pregnant again, and they already have a daughter. His neighbor and friend, Chinedu, just has gotten a promotion within the bank that he works for. And so he's heading at the beginning of the story, he's heading to the office on the first day. When he gets there, he is then introduced to his new supervisor and they go over this soul technology and part of his job is to go find people who need loans and are willing to give their destinies or their children's destinies as collateral. He doesn't see anything wrong with it. His boss has been up front that there, this is a legal gray area, there's no legislation against it, so this is what the bank is doing. And Chinenu goes back to his friend, Mukoro, and asks if he'd be willing to give up his daughter's destiny as collateral for a fund, for funding, so then he can complete his research. And he thinks about it, and he talks about it, and he's like, all right, he goes, so once I pay off the loan, my, I might get my daughter's destiny back. It's very important to me that she has her destiny. And Janadu's like, yeah, of course. Then it jumps forward some years and Mr. Makoro is having a hard time paying off the interest on his loan. And this is where we get to see the darker side of this process as there is no regulation for it. The bank doesn't actually want to give back the destinies that it has taken as collateral. It really wants people to default and then they can sell the destinies to someone else. Hence, the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer aspect. I thought this was also an interesting moment to kind of show attitudes in Nigeria because Makoro's second child is a boy and Janeiro, in the conversation they're having, he's like, well, isn't it okay if your daughter's destiny defaults? because you still have your son to worry about. And it's the whole concept of, yeah, you have a daughter, but your son should be more important. And the core is not having any of this. He's like, no, my daughter is equally important to me as is her destiny. 
and I'm not gonna spoil the ending of how everything gets solved. I, I enjoyed it. It, it took me the, a couple paragraphs to get into the rhythm of the writing, especially with how people are talking with one another. It, that seemed weird to me, but then again, it's not how I talk. So anytime you're reading dialogue for people in another country, it's going to feel off at first and then you get used to it. I can see that Ekpeki also was wanting to give the readers a bit of Nigerian culture, which is nice. So that is the first short story nomination that I've read. There's five more to go and I will check in later. Hi, I am back because I have read two more short stories. The first of which is DIY by John Wiswell. And I find this a very enchanting story. The narrator is Manny, but he starts off talking about Noah. And so it takes you a moment to realize that the narrator is actually a person in the story. This world is like a post-apocalyptic earth, but with magic that then fuels technology. And Noah has always wanted to be a wizard. He's been applying since he was a little child and he hasn't been getting in. And then this is a world that has inequality just like ours. And him and his mom will live in poverty. At the same time, climate change is happening and it is destroying health. And for him, it's giving him like asthma-like reactions to He's not able to breathe and when he gets angry he isn't able to breathe even more and eventually passes out. So the climate change is affecting his lungs. Despite all this, he's a child with hope, keeps applying, finally does get in to the, the magic academy except he doesn't get a scholarship and he's like, well I can't afford it. You would think that that would be the end of his dreams of magic. No, he still has dreams to solve the drought problem ends up meeting Manny through social media and they become first friends and then more than friends. It's a very sweet progression of that relationship and I really enjoyed that. The two of them come together and are trying to solve a way of getting water because this world in this climate change world water is becoming very scarce and of course the rich will still water their yard but then the poor don't have water to even drink so they're trying to come up with ways to get that water at the same time how they approach the problem what happens after they have a prototype and how sometimes only one or two minds can think very small but when you get more minds involved a different result is possible and yeah, I just adored this one. John Wiswell has that writing quality that taking life as we know it and then adding that fantastical element on top. And I think it is amazing. I think, yeah, just really enjoyed this story. And then the second story I read was Rabbit Test by Samantha Mills. Now this, I think, is prescient. I think that's the word I'm looking for. It is a timely story, especially coming off of the heels of post Roe v. Wade. At least I read it afterwards. I don't know if the story was published before or not, but it is a story of women's health and abortion, access to birth control, and how much are we teaching our daughters about their bodies and what their bodies do. I work in public health. So actually right now my clinic is in the process of moving Title X services, which are family planning services or women's health, like annuals, birth control, to another clinic in town and not to be operated at the health department, which has had a lot of debate among the staff and not everyone's happy with this transition. And so this short story resonates with me way more than it would, I think, any somebody who wasn't in the situation I'm in. I think it still resonates for women as a whole and anybody who actually cares about women's health, but losing an access to women's health and trying to consolidate in one clinic has us a little more on edge. And then it makes this sort of future plausible. Uh, sorry, I've gotten off on the tangent, but rabbit test is referring to a way to of early pregnancy detection 
and the main character, Grace, is 17, almost 18, about to graduate high school, and too, like, too much shy, and she finds out she's pregnant. She doesn't want to be, and so she looks for a way to have an abortion, which is illegal. She confides in her friend, and her friend ends up spilling it to her mom, who gets back to her parents, and so then her parents who are very much against abortions, like, lock her down, so she actually finishes the pregnancy. Interwoven with Grace's story, then with her daughter coming to age and facing a similar situation, is people from the past. It, it, Mills has interwoven history and historical ways of early pregnancy detection, birth control access, women getting to have control over their lives. She even has a nod to um, transgender, where someone who was once a woman has taken steps to also ensure that they aren't going to accidentally get pregnant. Like I said, it's a very poignant story. As Mills shows that women's history is cyclical, we are working to have autonomy over our bodies, and that fight, unfortunately, is going to continue into the future. Now, hers is more of a gloom situation before we might be able to get better, but still, like, this fight is real. I shared this with all of my coworkers on our team chat, and not knowing that if they even read science fiction, but so many of the nurses and other staff that I've worked with who've read it, they're like, I love this story. So yeah, I, I think Rabbit Test is timely in its delivery and it, it, it's touching a wide audience. It was definitely one that after I read it, before I could read it personally, I had to sit and think about it, but I knew I had to share it. And again, these short, these short stories will be linked down below. And if I can't link the stories directly, I will link the Locus magazine announcement, which does have five of the short stories linked. The, the sixth one, unfortunately, you have to buy the magazine. I have three more short stories to read. So I read the short story Doin by Suzanne Palumbo. I recognize the author's name because she was nominated last year for a short story award. So I was a little bit more prepared for island mythology or lore coming into the story. I think this one is set on an island because the main character talks about hearing the sea. But a Doan is a type of ghost. The author is from Trinidad and Tobago. And I, I think in her writing, she does a lot of great work pulling the mythology and the lore that she's grown up with into her stories. And then we as readers get to experience that. So in this one, the main character is a little girl who has died. It starts off at her funeral and she's seen everyone devastated and upset. She's like, I'm not in the coffin, I'm right here, guys. But she realizes that her body is not the way it normally looks. And all she wants is her mom. She just wants to be comforted by her mom and everything to be okay. And that is the story. The story is her journey to reconnect with her mom. And she's trying everything. And of course, there are different measures put in place where she's not able to talk to her mom. You find out that kids and then certain adults have the ability to communicate with the spirit world, but as the majority of adults grow up, they lose that ability. And I thought just her, Samantha is the main character, I just kind of thought her thought process as she's going along made complete sense. It's interesting following a child's logic who is also supernatural now. So I found I am not able to read Give Me English by A. Jiang at this time, all the copies of the magazine that story was published in have been sold out. And while the author has a copy that voting members of SIFWA can read, I am not a member of SIFWA, so I'm not able to read it. Yeah, I have no clue if this magazine issue is going to be published again. So I'm just considering this a pass because I don't have access to it. And it, that's all right. It, it happens if it gets nominated for the Hugos, then I believe I will get to read it, but 
as I can't read it now, I, I can't nominate it. While searching for this sor short story to see if I could possibly read it, I did come across that they are going to have some other works published this year that sound interesting. So the good thing about, you know, being nominated for an award is you kind of become on the radar of more readers and then they're like, oh, well, if I can't read your short story, maybe I'll check out your novel that's coming out in 2023. So the last short story is Dick Pig by Ian Munchoir. Uh, this is a weird one. I, I do need to put the caveat that I am not a horror reader at all. So when I know this is in a horror magazine, really I'm reading it just kind of waiting for like those horror elements to like hit, which does uh, change, I guess, how you read it when you're waiting for that jump scare or something like that. Because I didn't know what to expect. And it, this one started off weird with, I don't even think the main character's name ever gets mentioned, but he is cold in his aunt's house who has recently died and he gets on Grinder and then jerks off to some like, texting and pics and I'm just like, okay, interesting. And then, you know, he, it shows that this grander person is 15 miles away and things proceed from there where this grander person gets closer and closer and he's trying to find the secret that his aunt has left him in this house before it's given away or sold to someone else. Yeah, it, oh. With this character, because there's no other characters for him to interact with, we're really just getting his inner monologue. The author can write characters that are compelling and interesting. I'm gonna give him that, but I did not like the story. So I've shared this with my husband since my husband likes horror, just because I was wondering if maybe all like the sex talk and the sex stuff was throwing me off. I don't like a lot of that in my books unless it's specifically a romance. And even then a lot of the times I just skip those parts to get back to the story elements. But my husband, he said that he could see where horror elements were being played with from the, horror, the genre. But he thought that my assessment of like I didn't really like it or I was confused like what's going on. It, he felt it as well. My ultimate conclusion is kind of what I thought was happening as I was talking about it with them. Then he like started to say, well, what about these other things that were said in the text, which basically pokes holes through my theory. I'm not a big fan of sh short stories that just leave things open anyway. And that that's exactly what this one does. So if you're okay with that, you might get along better with this story. I did enjoy like the second person that we see at the very, very end to cap it off, you know, again, this author writes characters very, very well. I'd read more from him in the future, but maybe not a horror story. All right, so that is all of my short stories. I have read them all, all the ones I can get to. So just because I can't get to it, the lowest is going to be Give Me English by A. Jing. And then I have Dick Pig by Ian Monchoir. This got four stars still because of the amazing character work. While I didn't like a lot of the other elements of it, but it's my lowest four star. I use Copile to rate, so the range of four stars is like seven through an 8.9. So it's actually a very wide range. Then I have Destiny Delayed by Ohin Chovwe, Donald Ekpeki, and then tied for second or third place, depending on how you want to put that. I have Rabbit Test by Samantha Mills and Duan by Suzanne Palumbo. So all of those have been four stars. And then the one five star for me was DIY by John Wiswell. Just had that nice like magicalness to it. I don't know. It connected to me in a way that these other stories didn't. That is my thoughts about the short stories. Have you read them? If so, what do you think of them? How do you rank them? And if you were able to read Give Me English, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.